been on item number five, agenda number five, I know there's probably been a little bit of new information that's come in since last week. So unless commissioners have a lot of questions about what was presented last week at the work session, maybe we can start with the new information that has come to us over the week. Thank you. We can start with that um, since we have a lot of people in the audience. Yeah. Give you a quick overview of Thanks. exactly what the request is. I know with some of our public input, there's been some confusion as to what is actually being asked for. Um, but just to recap, of course, you have lots of information in your packets. This is a conditional use permit request by Verizon Wireless. Um, this is for a telecommunications tower to be located in R15 zoning. In your packet is a series of maps and diagrams. One is the zoning pattern of the area. Subject property is within the Valdosta Country Club. It is actually a proposed leased parcel at the north end of what we call the main property. So the map on your screen, which is the same as one of the maps in your packet, it shows a gray outline of what we call the main property of the Country Club. It's a portion of the golf course that is closest to the clubhouse. It is not all of the country club property, but simply the main portion. The subject property is a defined survey leasable area that includes a 100 by 100 foot tower site. Um, that is within that is a compound that is 60 by 60. I just wanted to emphasize that. Tower compound is not 100 feet wide, it is 60 feet wide, but the leasable area is a little bit around that. And then it's a pathway linking it um, kind of up and around to the east to the Bellevue Drive cul-de-sac. Um, if you go to the next map, aerial imagery, this is from 2007, which is our high resolution imagery. You see where we highlighted the 100 by 100 foot square, um, and this is drawn in pretty well to scale. It is within an existing clearing of some trees that are on the left side of the dogwood of the, that hole that's there, which I think is number eight. I have not played this course, so I'm not certain. Um, and then you see a cart path that loops around to the right, that is the official connection for the tower, and it comes out at the Bellevue Drive cul-de-sac. There'll be some photographs that show this sort of as a little walking tour for those of you who are not able to get out and actually walk the site. Um, the next image is some of the schematic drawings. I think there are three pages of this in your packet that show in greater detail. Some of the features, including topography, you see the X marks the spot for the tower. The proposal is for a 159-foot monopine tower. This is a new term. We talked about this at the work session. It is a tower that would resemble a large <coughs> tree, similar to the one at Sunset Hill Cemetery, except bushier. Um, and as a comparison, it is almost identical height. I think the one at Sunset Hill is 155. This would be 159 to the top of the lightning rod. Um, it's a newer design. Um, further in your packet, in the slideshow is the schematic. This is a cross-section view. Um, as you can see, it's a little bush here. It has four antennas on it. I think Sunset Hill has two antenna arrays. The next image is a photograph of an existing tower. I think this is by Verizon. This was taken several years ago at um, the Double Gate Country Club in Albany. This was uh, told shortly after the tower was erected before they put in the perimeter um, equipment and fencing. This is right after the tower went up. Um, it looks a little bit different than now, but this was a similar size structure and design, also in a golf course setting. However, in this case, you can see there's not a whole lot of education around the site. That's one of the differences with the country club right here. All right, next image. Um, these get into some of the handouts. Of course, there's a staff report and recommendation. One of the items I passed out this evening is a page that looks like one of the pages in the staff report. This is actually part B. This is our eight special condition of use um, criteria that apply only to towers. This is the first time this out of the LBR has ever been used. So what I've given you is those eight criteria and then staff's finding for each of those eight. And these are basically eight compatibility tests for a proposed tower whatever setting it may happen to be. And then as you see on all of these staff's finding is that it is compatible with each of these eight. The other item I gave to you is a map. This is straight out of our GIS system. It has an existing coverage for existing towers. Those are shown in the yellow tower symbols. And then in the center of the page is a red dot. That is the 
X marks the spot for the proposed tower. And it is to give you an idea of the big picture, uh, and you see it there on the screen, um, of where this proposed tower site is in relation to other existing telecommunications towers. To help put it in scale, if you look to the lower right in the five points area, you see a tower there, and that's, if you may recall, a pretty large one. Um, it is right by the Jungle Gems property, or what used to be the Jungle Gems. That is the closest existing tower to this site, and it is over one mile away. The other ones that are closer, or close by, second to this is over at Bemis Road, near where North Oak Street Extension intersects. That one is about two miles away. So the other ones over at exit 22 to the west, those are about two and a half miles away. One at the Y and one to the north of the river floodplain, and those are getting closer to three miles. So there is a good distance between this site and other existing towers in the area. The applicants are here with their engineer. They have some other schematics that they would like to share with you. They go into far greater detail. And being engineers, they're much able, better able to speak to this than I am. So that was the second one. The third is in your pack, there's already numerous letters. Uh, mostly against this request. We got some additional ones over the weekend and today. So I have compiled an addendum packet, and that is what these are. And some of these I think were emailed to you previously, and now you have a hard copy to go with the other hard copy <coughs> packet that you already have. So with that, we have a series of conditional use review criteria as well as telecommunication power criteria. Um, this is not the typical scenario. It is true that the city's development regulations discourages the placement of new towers in residential areas, and that is a very big topic um, and well-founded. Um, however, this is not a typical residential area. It is uh, much more sparsely populated than some. It is not in very close proximity, in my opinion, to existing residences, although I know some folks in the neighborhood will disagree with that. Um, in terms of radius, within a certain radius of this tower site. It is a limited number of dwelling units compared to other existing towers um, that are even in commercial areas. Um, so I just wanted to point that out. Um, so with that, the staff's main concern, and as we talked about the work session, um, is the specs. Um, how the tower looks, how it fits in as a land use within the surroundings. And so with that, staff bases its recommendation to you, which is to find consistent with the comprehensive plan. Both sets of the conditional needs for these criteria, which are in your packet, we're recommending approval of it with three conditions, and I want to make an amendment to one of them. But the first condition is, approval shall be granted for a cellular te telecommunications monopole tower on the subject property, which is <coughs> the site, monopoling the site in accordance with the submitted schematics and photographs. The tower shall not exceed 60 feet in total height above normal grade, shall contain no lights or beacons, and shall consist of no more than four antenna arrays, all of which shall be well hidden by simulated dense vegetation that is maintained by the tower owner. Number two, the least area around the base of the tower, here's where I'm making a minor change, shall be screened by an opaque fence, minimum of eight feet high, and shall be surrounded by a vegetative buffer as approved by the city arborist. All equipment within the area shall be shielded from view. All existing trees and other natural vegetation immediately outside the site shall be maintained to further obscure visibility of the tower facility. Keep in mind, as a footnote here, the city's development rates already require screening and buffering. We talked about that briefly at the work session. The city's development standards only require a six foot tall fence that is opaque plus a plant <coughs> Here I'm recommending an eight foot because of the long distance of visibility across the fairways. This is a little bit different than most of the settings where we find these. Third condition is conditional use approval shall expire after two years from the date of approval if no building permit for the new tower has been properly requested by that date. In closing, I want to go through some of these pictures, of which there are a number of them, but for those of you who are not familiar with the site, um, they give you a little walking tour here. The Country Club entrance is along Country Club Road. This is where the tower is being located. 
proposal for that site is about 3,000 feet away from here. Next picture shows the view across the golf course. You see the existing trees on the other side of the fairway. A lot of these tree areas ring the perimeter and in some cases separate the houses from the course itself. The tower site is not in this picture. It is beyond the trees off to the left. Next picture. This is the Bell B Drive cul-de-sac looking north. The driveway that you see beyond the little stop sign, um, some will call it a car path, it's actually the equivalent of a one-way driveway um, that wanders back into the golf course. This is all golf course property. Next picture is the walking through the path past the entrance. And the next picture, this is turning west, going along the fairway to the right. Um, part of the golf course is still on the left. We still have not come to the tower site. Next picture gets us down to near that curve. Off to the left is a grove of trees. You see the opaque fence. The proposed tower site is beyond the fence in the middle of that other grove of trees. Next picture, we get up closer to the fence. This is looking south. Um, this is the golf courses off to the right. Um, the fence there is already eight feet tall, opaque wooden fence, which actually blends in better, I think, with the wooded area than other fences would. Um, and then you see sort of a clearing in the tree canopy. That coincides with that aerial image in your packet, and that is where the tower site is proposed to be. Next picture. Um, next few we can sort of pattern through these. These are within the site. This is looking west toward the golf course. The next one is looking south through the trees. The golf course is beyond. And then the next one is looking east. You see another fence there. Um, and then beyond that is another open area. Um, I'm not sure what the plan was. It almost looked like a, a, a tee that was planned at one point, but no longer used that way. And then if you look very closely in the center of the photograph, you see um, the back wall of the closest house. That house is about 400 feet away from where I'm standing with this camera. Um, the next picture is outside that wooded area on the west side. This is where the car path loops around down toward the drainage way. This is looking north. Um, the proposed tower site is beyond the trees to the right, back in the trees. Um, beyond this, I think we have some pictures from the applicant. Oh, let me get to those adjacent properties. These next two photos, these are the houses along Bellmead. They're the closest to the site. Next one, and then beyond that, I think is the entrance way to Bellmead North. And beyond that, these are vantage points. These are simulated photos that were submitted by the applicant. The copy of these are in your packet. There's a series of six pictures here. Uh, three different points. This is, um, I think, to the north, looking south toward the site. This is the current view. The next photograph shows how the tower would superimpose on that image. And then the next one is from a point to the south of the tower site, looking north. This is the before. And then the after, and then this is, I believe, from the other fairway further away. This is the before, and then the after. So based on scaled imagery, this is what the applicant is presenting, is what the tower would look like after installation. If I've answered any questions you may have, there's a lot of folks here. I know we have imposed time limits. Um, the applicant goes first. And I think they've got some additional information to share. Okay. Commissioners. Yeah, right here. I, I do. I appreciate you uh, putting that verbiage in there about the age, but I would take the same from our discussion last week. Just for clarification, you stated that it cannot exceed 4 and 10, and that's the max that everything you put on there. Correct. And as a condition of approval, which means it's, some, it's not hard in stone which means if the applicant wants to increase that beyond four or increase the high or do anything that's different, they come back through this same public hearing process and re request a reapproval. So in other words, it's a tower limited to the scope and design that you see on those schematic drawings. It looks like a tree, four antennas within the tree fold, <coughs> no more. Any other questions for staff? Madam Chair, I, I yes. have a couple of questions. Matt, if I understood you right, <clears throat> you were saying that the city discouraged 
uh, cell phone towers within the city. Within and residential areas. Residential areas, okay. And there's four <coughs> towers already just within a mile or two mile radius there of one another already. I'm just curious why there's a second, why it's needed, but they don't have that much uh, reception <coughs> between two miles apart. Sure. The, the closest one is a mile away. Okay. The next closest one is two miles away, and the others are further. So you have to put this on is sort of you see the void in between the locations. I think that's why the applicant was looking at this area of the city to try and find a site to fill the gap. They can explain that far better and far more technical than I can. But it's, we get into radio frequency engineers and folks like that. I was just curious if you're going to put an antenna up every mile to be able to talk to somebody. I hope not. If you look at some of our existing pattern, a mile separation seems to be about that. Okay, that's just curious. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions from our commissioners before we turn it over to public participation? Okay. All right. So I will now call on those wishing to speak on behalf of the request. Please come forward. Good evening. My name is Andy Rodenstrike. This is for 2020 Street North in Birmingham. If I could have had some handouts, I could give them the map, but anyway. Mr. Rodenstrike, could you spell your last name for us? Yes, R O T E N S T R E I C H. Thank you. So, Matt, thank you for that introduction. Uh, I'm here on behalf of Verizon Wireless. I have with me Brian Devine, who helps uh, work to locate an area in this uh, general vicinity that would work for Verizon and also uh, help us meet your orders, because that's what we're here to try and do. Uh, this property is 330 acres, the golf course. We are going to an area that Matt showed to the north. The reason that site was chosen was because of the tree coverage and the accessibility. And where we were going to be in an area that was had a large enough area to place the tower so we wouldn't have to cut down trees. And also an area we could uh, use to get out of. And also an area where we uh, could blend in as much as we can. We know we're in a wooded area here. The first thing that Verizon tries to do when it needs coverage in an area is to look for existing towers and existing tall structures. I'll show you in a minute a map that illustrates the area that Verizon needs to be in to get the coverage that we need in this area and also show you why we need the coverage here. If there is no tall structure or existing tower, our only alternative is to come before you and request a new tower, which is what we're here about tonight. We, are, we know we're in and near a residential area, so we're not coming to you with a 350-foot request or request for a 350-foot lattice tower, not one with the big guide wires on it with the flashing lights on it. We are here with what we consider and in the industry the least obtrusive design, which is a single pole, we call it a monopole. In addition to that, again, knowing where we are in the city, but having to be in this area to get the coverage we need, we have proposed to camouflage the tower as a tree, uh, just like the trees in the area. Now, we need to be above the trees, because if we can't get above the trees, the signal gets blocked. So the trees in the area roughly are 90 to 110 feet tall. We are requesting a 155 foot pole with a four foot lightning rod, also for the branches to extend up above the antennas and the pole to hide the actual pole itself. So if you would, uh, look at the handout that I've seen, uh, handed out to you. The first few pages you've seen, just wanted to make sure they were in the presentation. But again, the subject property is Matt showed. The second page is the aerial view, again, showing where uh, the tower would go on the property and how it's screened with the vegetation around it. The third page is the schematic drawing of what we're proposing to do there with the branches, the fake branches and the fake needles. And again, the fourth one is the page 
from the Double Jay Country Club mono pine that was built uh, in Albany. The fifth page I'd like to start with kind of discusses why we need to be in this area. So this map uh, is a map of existing towers in and around the area, similar to what Matt shows you. But these are sites where Verizon is located. Verizon is not on every tower that has shown that Matt has used uh, or shown in his map because if some of them are so close together they would overlap and interfere with each other. So we have to build our network like a honeycomb, right? Can't be too close to the next tower or too far away. You could have dead spots or interference. So it's very precise where we need to be. So the red uh, triangles are existing Verizon sites. The green in the middle is the proposed site we're here about tonight. If you look, you can see around the green, we've kind of got this area surrounded, but we've got this gap in the center of this coverage. If you turn the page where it says the existing LTE coverage, this is a propagation map that shows Verizon's coverage in this area. Let me explain the colors to you. This is the same map as the page before, it's a little enlarged. We've got the same existing Verizon sites. Uh, there are those uh, triangles that have the names next to them. The green is what we refer to as in-building coverage. That's when you can use your phone, your iPad, your laptop, when you're inside a building like we're in now. As you get further away from the towers, the signal dissipates, you get into the yellow and red areas. Those are areas where we're trying to improve the coverage. So you can see in the middle of this area, we have a coverage need with the red and the yellow in the center. That's the need for the tower. If we're allowed to build this tower, turn to the next page, that's the exact same map as before, but with this site turned on. You can see how the yellow and red become green. We therefore are offering the latest 4G LTE technology to the businesses, residences, country club in that area and the travelers. Not to mention folks, God forbid, that may need to connect 911 service. God forbid first responders need to connect during a crisis. This will provide the needed coverage in that area. <coughs> there is a tower to the south and the east. If you look on the next page, it's marked in yellow. Again, that's the same map, but you see a site to the south and east marked in yellow. That is the site that Matt has marked near the five points area. We looked at trying to co-locate on that tower, but if you look at the coverage we get from two pages before, it doesn't fill our significant gap in coverage. Because that tower would not work for Verizon, we could not use it. If we were to co-locate on that tower, we would still need the tower we hear about tonight. So we looked at that option, even though that was not in our search area. If you turn to this page, this will kind of get into why we ended up in this particular location. So in order to get the green signal that I showed you in the map before, we have to have a tower somewhere in this red circle, not really a circle, maybe an octagon. If you can see from this aerial map, most of the property within that red octagon is Valdosta Country Club. All of it is zoned residential. We have to be within this octagon in order to get that service. You will see off to the left, there's some yellow uh, highlighted properties that say owners unresponsive. Those actually are some commercial zone properties. We went to those landowners to see if we could lease property from them because we have to have a willing landowner. And we have... <coughs> An affidavit, I've got a few copies of these, but I'll give this to Matt for the record. The, attached to the affidavit are letters sent to the landowners in yellow asking them if they would be interested in leasing space to Verizon. There was no response from these landowners in yellow. If we did, we would be trying to get on it. So, without any response from these three landowners, there's multiple parcels, but it's only three landowners. We have no choice but to be in a residential zone property. The country club was the largest tract of land in 330 acres. If you look on the next page, which is the last page of that packet, 
That's the same map as before. So you see the light blue and the blue with red stripes on the left side and on the top left. That is a flood zone area. So we could not build in a flood zone. So because of that, we ended up where it says proposed model time. So I show you this for a couple of reasons. Number one, we did our homework here. We did, we're not just coming in and saying we want a tower, we want it here, and you got to prove it. That's not what we're doing. We have a specific need in a specific area. We reached out first to see if there was any existing towers. There were none. We reached out to commercial zone property landowners. We received no response. And our, uh, the only option was Valdosta Country Club who was willing to enter into a lease with us. And we have placed it in a wooded area to try and shield it as much as we can. And we've also agreed to try and camouflage. So with that said, you have your ordinance in place. We meet all the conditional use criteria in your ordinance. And as Matt said, there's actually two sets of criteria we have to meet because of the tower. Your regular, regular conditional use requirements, and then another set of requirements for telecom towers. And as Matt has pointed out, we agree that we have met all of those provisions. Now remember, we know this is a poll. We can't take away the fact that it's a tall poll. But we're doing our best to camouflage it as much as we can, to place it in the best spot possible. Remember, this is a cell tower. There's no light, <coughs> there's no noise, there's no <coughs> dust, no odor, no vibration, no traffic. Once this tower is complete, Verizon will have a service technician in an <coughs> SUV going to the site about every four to six weeks to check the radios that are on the ground within the lock and fence compound. So it's a pretty innocuous use. Now I understand our concerns and questions about three main topics. Number one, health effects. Number two, aesthetics. And number three, property values. Mr. So, Robert Child, in order to be fair, we are at 10 minutes. Okay. Why don't we turn it over to the commissioners and if they have any questions of you. Um, <coughs> and that way hopefully we can stay within our required time. Okay, commissioners? How deep into the ground are you going with those bowls? That boat. How far down into the ground? Okay, how far into the ground? I'm sorry. Um, there will be a footing. I don't know exactly how far down, but typically it's 10 feet or so to make sure we get a good footing. Uh, and of course, the strongest part of the tower would be at the base. Okay. Yes. Yes, sir. Uh, would you? Uh, I, have, I, have I can't hear you, sir. Can, can you turn up my volume? Just a, is it up? Thank you. I've had numerous phone calls concerning uh, the medical issues. Would you address uh, some issues as far as cancer related or is it or either affecting medical equipment? So. Yes, sir. Let me grab something to help illustrate. So, um, in 1996, the federal government passed the Telecommunications Act, which basically talked to this issue. The purpose of that act was to promote the advancement of wireless service and the infrastructure. That federal law specifically says that local governments cannot deny cell towers based on perceived health effects. But that's the law. I know we don't like to be told what we can and can't do. In addition to that, I have some material which I'm happy to leave to folks that have concerns uh, from the FCC, from the American Cancer Society, and from the Food and Drug Administration, all addressing this issue of cell towers and health effects. All of those uh, organizations, through their research, have said there is no negative health effects for cell towers. So with that said, I'll be happy to hand these out. What was your third point you were talking about? Property values. Property aesthetics. values. So, would, would, would you address property values or aesthetics? Would, I mean, yeah. Right. Look pretty good. Um, so property values. Um, in order for something to be negatively affected by property values, you would look at the sale price of a home near a cell tower, or before the cell tower was built. Then you look at the sale price after the tower was built to see if the cell tower caused the price to go down. So we actually did a property evaluation report, an appraisal, so to speak. 
uh, for the site in Albany at the Country Club at Double Gate. And I've got a copy here I'll be happy to leave with you. But we've done several of these around Georgia and in other states in the southeast. And the, every one we have done and looked at, none of them have come back by looking at the data with a home that sold for less than it sold before the tower was built, that sold for less after the tower was built. None of that has been the case. There is no negative effects from property values. In addition to that, again, not to get too much in the legalese, but the courts have also heard this case. There was a situation where AT&T uh, wanted to build a cell tower in their neighborhood. Uh, the local government denied it. AT&T sued the local government. While the case was pending, AT&T placed a temporary cell tower, the same height as the proposed tower, in that location. It was a, what we call a cell on wheels, a cow, and literally it's a trailer with a mast. And while that temporary site was there, a, an appraisal was done on homes to see if it negatively affected it. And they didn't. And the court said we could see in that particular case the towers do not negatively affect property values. And so the courts ruled because of that that they do not. And such a denial based on that would not amount to substantial evidence, which is required under the law. Thank you. So I hope that helps. Just and I can leave Just a quick case on the medical stuff, did you say the AMA is one that did the report for you? I've got Food and Drug Administration, uh, the FCC, which regulates cell towers, and the American Cancer Society. I would have to leave a couple of these with Matt if folks in the audience want a copy of it. Thank you. Do the commissioners have any further questions for our speaker? Madam Chairman. Yes, Commissioner Willis. Yeah. You know, based on everything you said, you walked in here and said that we don't have a choice. Uh, mm. And well, that bothers me a little bit from a, from a local standpoint. Because I don't like to be, personally, don't like to be threatened and, and say you've got to do it this way. Um, so, I, you know, I, what I'm hearing you say is, is we don't have a choice. Well, or, is that what you're saying? No, sir, I'm not. Okay. Uh, just just me, Well, I understand because it's a fine line I'm trying to find, yeah. right? I mean, I'm trying to let you guys know what the current state of the law is. <coughs> I think that's important that we need to follow the law. And I don't know to what extent the city attorney has told you guys what to say the law is. So my intent is to tell you what the law is. Uh, the federal law says, you know, we're not, I mean, this is important, and I'll make sure I state this correctly. It says, um, that local governments still have the right to regulate towers. The federal law says that. But you just said we did. No, what the law allows you to do is pass an ordinance to regulate towers, to make it tougher for me to put one in residential areas. i got to get a conditional use. I can go into an industrial area of town and just get approval from Matt to move forward. So you can regulate by making it tougher, putting more requirements on me to get it in a residential area, make me show you why we need it. There's a significant gap in coverage. There was no other alternative. And that's what your ordinance does. So the local government still has control of the placement by passing its ordinance. But here, we meet the ordinance. There's rules out there, we follow the rules, and so we would request approval. But I felt it was important for you to know what the state of the law was. By no means am I trying to tell you what you can't can do. I don't like them to be able to do it to me. I'm yeah. not trying to do it to you. It's almost like a threat that we, you know, that if we don't approve this, we're going to be sued. But one more question, yes, sir. One more question. There's a lot of people in the room here that is against some of them, maybe for them. Have you had the opportunity to speak with those and see what some of their concerns is and see if you could resolve it? Well, um, I think the concern of as we spoke of, uh, I do know there was a neighborhood meeting, uh, and I think uh, Brad, who's going to stand up speak on behalf of the club, uh, was there at the meeting. Uh, we knew about the meeting shortly before, or maybe right after it happened. But the information we have is on file. Most of everything I've showed you today is on file with Matt. Uh, but we're actually happy to answer any questions tonight if we can. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, 
So we allowed um, our speaker to have the full 10 minutes and then the uh, rest of the time was questions for the commissioner. If there is one other person here who would like to speak on behalf of the request, I will allow it. Anyone wishing to speak on behalf of the request? <laughs> Mr. Folsom, how much time do you need? A minute, okay. I'll hold you to it. All right. I represent <laughs> out of the uh, number of people, I don't mean 10 or 12, but the number that you used, about how many said yes and how many said no? Did I understand you say they all won? The people we have heard from that are in the crowd you were here from are mostly, as I understand the residents along Bellevue Drive. We actually, of, the, of I'll say the four residents closest to this hour, one being uh, Lake Cars on Plantation Drive, one being Greg Talley who going to the end lot on Bellamy, and then the other two would be uh, Mr. Reeves next door and uh, Ms. Kitchens next door. 
I know Greg Kelly and Lou Link Walker are perfectly fine with it. We approached them because they were members of the club. Um, right about the time we signed the lease. I've since learned that Mr. Reed has not been played well. Um, I respect his opinion like I do all the time. The, the reason I'd ask that question is the people who are living in that community, if they're okay with it, I, I feel better. No. 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 Okay, um, please, you'll get your opportunity to speak. Do we have any other questions? Thank you, Mr. <coughs> All right, in the interest of fairness, I'm going to tack two minutes because he actually spoke for two minutes before commissioners started asking questions. So I'm going to tack two minutes and I will give all those who wish to speak against, you'll have a total of 12 minutes. And keep in mind, in order to keep this running smoothly, if we don't repeat anything, we can hear from a lot more people. So um, I will call the first person who wishes to speak against the request to please come forward. And when you do, please state your name and address for the record. And could you pull the mic down so we can hear you? Thank you very much. Don't be. My name is Jane Williams. I've lived in seven Bellevue for the last 25 years. Can I hear? Can I hear? at the end of Bellevue Drive. Just 17 days ago, a neighbor told me a public notice sign circled saying that Bellevue Horizon wanted to put up a cell tower nearby. I told her, I think the zoning people made a mistake. They must have meant to put that Stand sign up, up on Country Hall Rock and North Dalmatia Road in a more commercial area. I was wrong. Only one owner of a vacant lot near the tower site was consulted before by the Country Club. The two owners most affected and the rest of us were not. The club and Verizon had blindsided us. And I'm going to uh, just add in, I wish I'd brought my picture, because I have pictures looking at those two properties right from that same fence, and you can see right into their backyard. In one of them, I could actually look on their back porch and see their two rocking chairs. It's that close. But I'm concerned that property values will be hurt because of the cell tower. I saw a study that said 94% of a thousand people asked, said that cell towers and antennas in a neighborhood would impact their interest in a property and the price they would be willing to pay for it. I know I wouldn't want to buy a house close to a cell tower. In fact, if the cell tower does go up, I plan to move. I'm not going to wait around 10 years to find out if there are health dangers caused by living near a cell tower. Your zoning website says, zoning is the means by which the city ensures protection of property from incompatible uses. This Verizon site is in an overwhelmingly residential area. It includes houses along Plantation, Bellmead, Lake Lori, and Arbor Run. You have to drive 1.1 miles from the site to reach the commercial area where Chick-fil-A is. And you have to go 1.2 miles to North Valdosta Road to the commercial area where the banks are. The Verizon Tower would clearly be in an incompatible residential area. Zoning regulations in Chapter 218, Article 4, Section C, under findings, says that telecommunication towers, when inappropriately located, have the potential to pose a danger to surrounding property owners and the general public. Regulations C1, C2, and C4 say that telecommunication facilities should be avoided in residential areas whenever possible. They should be encouraged to locate in non-residential areas. They should be encouraged to locate where the impact on the community is minimal. 
I ask you to ask Verizon to put up a balloon or crane, and I think you may have heard that's a possibility, so the visual impact of the cell tower can be evaluated. I ask you to table your decision for a month. One week until the city council meeting is not enough time for members to hire a lawyer and property consultant as some plan to do. I urge you to follow your own written regulations and proactively encourage Verizon to put the cell tower in a location outside our residential area. If they can find no other place in all of Valdosta, then no neighborhood is protected. Wood Valley, the houses behind the Valdosta High School, the Gornco Road, in Jerry Jones residential areas, none of them are safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We have questions of our speaker. Any commissioners have questions for our speaker? Okay, thank you. Next, speaking against the request, we'll need your name and address, please. My name is Randall Turn it up. My name is Randall Cruz, 3325 Bellman um, I created a little diagram map on what we can pass around, but you can really see, obviously, the residential, it's all around. The only part that, of, of the country club property that is zoned commercial is right there where the place is. Everything else is zoned to our 15. You can see the map pass this around you can see it on uh, the other maps. So you can see, I mean, the proximity of the is where they're putting it. This is Bellamy, this is Plantation. It's going to be really pretty close. So that's only part of the concern is the proximity of it to the houses. Access, the only part that's commercial, that has a commercial driveway or any access is deemed to be commercial access, which is to be thinking to be what a cell tower ought to be located in a commercial area, not in a residential area. Looking at 100% of the access, it's not going to interfere with that. It's going to enter through this private, I mean, through, it's a city street, but if you look, Bellamy Drive comes in, curves, comes around, all these curves. It's a minimum width roadway, a typical neighborhood city street. It's not, you know, it's not a 40 foot wide, or it's really meant for a lot of parking. People park on the side of the road all the time. But in addition to all of our normal traffic that, um, that comes down to the country club does all of its operations for all of their grounds maintenance and things that, all of those employees. When they come to work, they don't come to the pub to go to work. They go all the way down Bellamy and drive this same path from here. So every car that comes in comes out the same way. It's already being utilized in a way as a, a commercial road or commercial access to the piece of property because of the country clubs already using it. So they're not going through their property. I had uh, written a letter. We weren't you know, keyed up about it or told them anything about it. I that uh, Mr. Cowley, who owns an empty lot down there towards the end where this is going, was notified in July, I think, I guess, when they were first talking about this. We didn't know anything about it. Fortunately, you guys did. Because if it weren't for the LDR and you guys being in place, all the things we would do, we wouldn't have anything about it. You know, they roll down the road with cranes and big trucks and all that kind of stuff, but they'd be building it before we ever knew anything. But fortunately, Barasta has you guys in place to be able to, to have that filter to be able to say, wait, we got to get permission. And then I guess Matt, your office went out there and put signs out. That was the first news we ever, any of us on that I ever heard anything about you know, when we put the cell tower on there. Um, I, uh, I, I wrote a letter, again, just finding out about it. I wrote it over the weekend to my <coughs> to, uh, Matt this morning. I'm just going to, it should be, I guess, in the your package. I'm going to go in. And I'm not going to try to repeat anything she says, but it was definitely. The LDR provides guidelines and, and it, it says avoid residential. Avoid, it's in several uh, paragraphs C.1, C.2, C.4, C.10. Say, stay away from residential, but all possible stay away from residential. There's a tower, and I'm not sure if it's a full mile away. I guess the riding is probably a mile away for the adjacent tower that's up behind the old lows in that commercial area. Again, where you know, residences are under the tall commercial areas. Um, the, um, there's other people. Uh, Where do you go to Ohio? Yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Um, 
We have three minutes left on the against side. Okay. Okay. We've got no time. Uh, in the application, LDR 218K requires that we should have identified nearby towers in the application, in the original application. I had provided this to me uh, on Friday. I didn't see where a lot of those steps in the LDR were really followed. I know that he's supplementing with that. I guess it's something that we Please, if we can't be quiet, then we're going to have to ask you to step outside while he finishes. So Go ahead. Here, sustainability, property value, existing cell towers, again, are in the vicinity. Traffic, I'll talk about traffic, well means a curvy dead end road is already being used by a country club as a commercial access to serve the golf course facility. Um, aesthetics, it's, it's a tower. It's going to be a tower that looks like a tower in the middle, from a distance, it looks like a tree. Environmental, I also noticed in the document that said there were no weapons. Uh, at or adjacent to the site, I can assure you there are jurisdictions of weapons that are adjacent to the site. Just because they're not on the national weapons inventory map or any of that, they do exist to the south more than the north east of the site. I can't, I live there, I know, I know where the weapons is, I'm in here, I've told you, and I, I know what it is, and think they are there. And, and noise, they talked about trying to make any noise. It's going to have a, a gas or a diesel operating generator, it's going to have some sort of fuel operating generator. If anybody knows anything about generators, Basis, at least once a week for a period of time, plus any kind of power goes out. So the noise is a factor, and that's probably one of the many reasons why the LDR system is Thank you. Do we have questions? Yeah. <clears throat> I got right. one. Okay. Just, just a question. Do you feel like you need more time to discuss this and see with the club or whatever to resolve some of the issues, or are you pretty much comfortable where you're at? Traffic affecting that tower. The um, I know they'll say, well, they're only going to go visit it a like, prison time. I think a lot of them sell towers we put on this property and all. Yeah, how often are they there? They're there all day. Yeah, I don't know what that means. Every day, every couple of days, they're there whenever they need to be there. And it won't just be the rise on the tower. I'm sure they're going to have other entities that are going to put it. So it won't really be multiple people going in and out anytime they're going to service it and uh, maintain it, update it. Five years down the road, they decide to add another engine. All the other people already be here. The natural thing will is like there, but this is going to be another engine. But then again, that will add to the number of people that come to the air to be able to service it. All right. I believe we have a question from Commissioner Wallace. I had a question about uh, the coverage issue. The purpose of having the power there is to improve the coverage for you people in the area of the power. It's great. So it's great. Everybody, that everybody doesn't care to have better coverage than you have, and even for the future when things improve and you need to, uh, to kind of amp up what you may already have. Well, the thing about that is when we're there, we're at home. I have Wi-Fi. So when, as soon as I go into the house, I'm not using LTE or, or any of that. I'm, I'm on my Wi-Fi. Probably inside this room, you guys are all connected to the Wi-Fi. You're not using it. So there was mention of first responders needing additional coverage in the area. If they were to be there and they were trying to log in to certain sites to get information. I've had full bars on my phone. I've never heard of anybody in our area. Sometimes when you pass by the Ops State University, um, I used to get a drop call, but that's long since been corrected. I guess I've never been there. I've never lost a call. I mean, so it's clear to everybody that this tower is there to serve you. We've run out of time, but I'm going to allow one last speaker. Please state your name and address for the record, please. Thank you, Blake Judy. I live at 33 Freestyle Plantation Drive. I'm a member of the Country Club. Um, and real quick, space of time, I 
I've Verizon. I don't have any problems with my cell phone. The other thing, too, is you'll, you'll hear some see doctors we have here that have concerns about no issues with the tower. The other thing is, talking about property values, you can get all kinds of answers. But we have people who would tell you that in cell towers, in neighborhoods, you can have a negative impact on your property value. Uh, so that, that should be a concern. And the other thing, too, is you look at these people out here, these are all homeowners that live in there, that feel very strong and it's been negatively impacted. And they spent a lot of money, as almost everybody is doing, in buying a home. And been negatively impacted, it's wrong. We're all citizens here in the same community. So you look at those people and tell them that no, they should be concerned. I thank you for your concern. Thank you. the public participation portion. I will now turn it back over to the commissioners for discussion. Yes, Mr. Folsom, uh, one of the commissioners would like to ask you a question. Mr. Folsom, I have a question for you. Um, I'm assuming that there are um, member a member board at the Country Club, correct? And that member board was a part of making this decision? The club, the club is a corporation. Okay. It's run by a board of directors who's elected by the membership. That board of directors is empowered to deal with the property of the club by bylaws. And they properly vet this decision and make the decision on that membership as their empowered to do by the bylaws. Okay, so they were not informed prior to this um, deal being culminated? The, the members of the country club? No, 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 no. we're not. Okay. Nor do they, nor Someone. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Colson. All right. Um, it's turned back over now to the commissioners for any further discussion or in lieu of discussion, a motion. Yes. You certainly may. I know that a couple of presenters this evening were concerned about what is the definition of a residential area, and I know you spoke about it, but you also included the verbiage as a container within 330 acres. So can you give me some better clarification on what is considered residential? Everyone will have different opinions of residential area, whether there's a few residences or a high density of residences. Um, to me, this is a residential area, but I consider it low density. Um, compared to units per acre, just on an average, there's a lot of vacant, residential land within it. It is all zoned residential. Some people will consider that to be the definition based on the zoning pattern. So there's different arguments there, how it can be deemed. But yes, it is no doubt residential. It's also recreational, but it is not high density. Any other questions for staff? If there, yes. Question? Madam Chair, I would like to say that uh, I am not going to be able to support this for approval of the City Council. And I would like to explain my position as to why. Uh, Matt and his department, as usual, have given us excellent information on this case. They always do. They have touched on the land use issues, the zoning issues, and the future development. But I remain unconvinced. 
testified as a two speakers we had who posted a good job, but there's not an alternative site without off the country club. 